week. Uh, she's working at her uh, PhD supervisor, Sir uh, Robin Ball and uh, Robert McKay, that some of you might, uh, might know. And uh, she's giving that open, uh, she's giving that open uh, persistent motor information and magic supernatures. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so this incongruous title is my attempt to link two different directions. But quantifying emergence that is sort of exemplified by the opinions of my two supervisors. So the first half of the talk will be about persistent mutual information, um, which is more Professor Ball's style. And the second is um, partially about the diversion metric. I won't be able to say much about it because the metric is held to calculate. But you'll be able to say something, or at least perhaps put it in context. Um, but the main body of work is about persistent mutual information. So, first we'll define it, and then, so it's basically uh, a measure of emergence, and it's a, it's functions from probabilities. So we're going to be using that function on data sets generated by dynamical systems. And we'll talk about a one-dimensional dynamical system, well actually perhaps two one-dimensional dynamical systems, dissipative ones, and then, for the most part, we'll talk about the standard map, which is a two-dimensional area preserving uh, dynamical system. Okay? And we'll see what happens then. And then we'll talk about the diffusion metric a little bit. So first of all, persistent mutual information. Um, most of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the definition of mutual information. Right? It's the deficit um, of the sum of the shallow entropies of the marginal, marginals and the Shannon entropy of the joint. So if there is no, if the marginals are absolutely independent, then mutual information um, is zero. Okay? So it basically, it quantifies the degree of dependence. Um, right? So now persistent mutual information is something quite specific. It's when we have, first of all, flat distribution over all the possible past configurations of some system. We evolve the distribution to get some future distribution. And we look at the mutual information between these two distributions. So when we say persistent, we mean the information that persists across some time gap. We can vary how large this time gap is. Later, we'll talk about permanently persistent mutual information, i.e. something that uh, the past, that the past knows about the future independent of how large you make the time gap. Okay. Now we use it, well we don't use it, we postulate that it's a measure of strong emergence. Um, I.e. the extent to which a system's evolution can be predicted from its past. But that's kind of not important for, for now. Um, it sort of lies in the context of other, primarily computationally mechanical, quantities, um, but, it's <coughs> but it's slightly different. So here we have the past, here we have the future, they're separated by a time gap, um, and then you take ideally limit of infinite past and infinite future, and maybe limit of infinite time gap. So let's see how this works. Okay. No? <laughs> Sorry, let's try again. Counterpart. 
separated by a time gap tau. It's some typical time gap, doesn't come into it. Okay? So essentially, it's how much the past knows about the future. Just to speak very, very loosely. Okay? So here, for example, the attractor set um, will, well, it's period two. Okay? Here, it's um, chaotic balance two. Okay, balance two chaos. So what we see is that this measure essentially picks up the periodicities in the system. We see also that it doesn't really care about it. Well, it looks through the overlay of chaos. Okay? So it's not prediction in the sense of, well, if the system is chaos, it's much less predictable than if it's not chaos. No. Um, this is uh, a measure of emergence that says, okay, how many choices does the system spontaneously make? Sorry, not spontaneously make. How many choices does the system have to make? So, for example, in all this case, this choice is a choice of phase. Okay? So, it could either be oscillating up, down, up, down, or it can do the reverse. And actually, in the chaos uh, part, it does the same thing. So, it jumps across chaotic bands. Where it lands, it's determined by the rule, but the periodicity is still there. Okay? And so here we pick it up. Um, obviously, at the period doubling accumulation point, it will shift to infinity, but our current resolution isn't big enough. Also, all this part would consist of peaks if only we zoom in into the parameter enough. What's the meaning that when you have uh, period two or period four, mm. this measure is larger than when you have no period? Um, <coughs> so if you have period four, then essentially there are well four choices of phase. Right? So depending on where you start in the initial configuration space, you will at a time t you will be in either of the four points. So we, we measure how much choice there is. Okay? This is important. We don't measure the relative size of the basins of attraction of basins of attractions for different um, phases. That will be a different thing, and it's very give us nice um, periodicities <coughs> for that phase. Um, so yes. So what can we see? Um, we see that PMI picks up global periodicities. Um, also, if we're not careful with what we measure, and we don't measure the attractor, we would see peaks here. Now, peaks at uh, the point where it's the period doubles. That is because at those points, there are uh, slow relaxation times towards equilibrium. So, you need to be careful how, do you, how to get to the, attractor, to the attracting set. Um, it's kind of hard to measure this. This is based on the Haskell estimate for mutual information. Um, we found that if you use any other estimator, it's it's heavily either undersampled or oversampled and very prone to errors. Um, so thus PMI becomes logarithm of the period. Or if you can't really resolve the period, then logarithm of however large a periodicity you can resolve. Um, I will talk about this later. So, um, it's very good at picking up periodicities, I think is the, the main message of the ledger sigma. So, if you, for example, look into the band 2, um, here's band 2 side, here we see period tripling and then period doubling. Um, or, for example, if we zoom in, onto the period street free structure, remember the three period free structure that appears um, suddenly out of chaos. Um, and if you look on the right hand side of the period three structure, we see again period tripling and then period doubling. This is a new sort of world three. Obviously if you zoom in more you will pick up even sort of stranger things. Um, so it's a simple measure for that. So then we think that okay we, we can quantify this amount of choice by taking the time limit in between as going to infinity. 
Um, so we say that the permanently persistent mutual information quantifies the degree of um, the stress. Okay? Now, this, I'm not really being fair, this is shown for reference. This is from a paper by Feldman, um, where he is giving two perhaps quite famous measures of <coughs> excess entropy and entropy rate. Okay? Computation and mechanic um, quantities. Also for the logistic map. Um, and here, well, entropy rate would be related to the level of experiment. So, um, and excess entropy also seems, well, it will be related to the entropy rate. So, this is slightly different, perhaps more towards the soft inversion side than um, strong inversions, but yes. So, that is the logistic map. We can also just change the, um, the map and see what this measure gives us for the tent map. Now, tent map looks kind of like the logistic map, but it's straight, so it's not the parabola. Um, and u is the parameter. <coughs> so here are some divergence diagrams, and this, this is a divergence diagram, and these are the bifurcation diagrams. Now there C is half our um, half our mu. So again, what we see is chaotic balance, and we see that um, we see very similar behavior. Okay? Also bands merging and PMI um, increasing. Now the perhaps interesting thing is the difference. What happens at two specific uh, parameter values? So. Here, on the, on the bifurcation diagram, we see a straight line. Now, this straight line is to do with how I've done the bifurcation diagram. Um, what it means is that, is that, that this parameter value, almost every point is an attracting uh, point. And so, PMI is zero. Um, but actually, for the sort of symmetric point, for mu is minus one, although we still see a straight line, here, for this region of the state space, almost every point is period two points. So there's a difference between the positive and the negative so map. And here, um, PMI gives log two. So even though there is similarity in this type of picture, although this might be only one way of constructing application diagrams, there is a difference in PMI. Um, I mean, you would sort of see this if you iterate Sent up twice, and you start on the positive side because it will just go back to the positive. But yes. Um, so this is how it works in distributive systems. It picks up a period. Yes. I'm confused. In the on the left panel, so I was understanding that you have uh, period two. The PMI is what well, divided by the log. It was one, right? Because you have two choices. Yes. But that is supposed to happen as something around uh, minus one, right? But there, the value of the red line is much larger than that, right? So, this one, this one. The one is between minus 1.2. Ah, this is okay. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> self answer. <laughs> self answer. <laughs> Can you repeat the definition of C? Um, I think that C is half of our mu. So there C is minus one and we have minus two. Okay. But it's, it's, it's the same system. Um, yes. So now let's look at the standard map. Um, standard map is, or perhaps called cherry of standard map, it's a Poincare cross section of um, a Hamiltonian system. Okay. Now, um, that Hamiltonian system can either be integrable or not integrable. Okay. And when k is zero, <coughs> the original system is integrable. So what we will see in the cross-section are just peri periodic and quasi-periodic points. They will lie on top. Um, so k is a, it's a degree of non-linearity. Okay. Perhaps also the amount of non-interpretability in some fuzzy way. Um, basically here, there is a, 
all the points lie between 0 and 2 pi, you normalize it's actually between 0 and 1. Um, and our k is between 0 and 2 pi. So when k is 0, the system is uh, completely solvable, and there are only periodic and quasi-periodic trajectories. Now, when k is 2 pi, then there is only one periodic trajectory. There might be some islands of periodicity, but we don't detect them as our solutions. So when k is 2 pi, there's one periodic trajectory thrown around the space. So um, the result is last week. Okay? And there are, there are no periodic and no quasi periodic um, Now, it's, uh, it's showable. So, right. Okay, so this is a small value of k. So this is the state space of the standard map. Um, if k is zero, then you just get straight lines. Okay. Um, so x is on horizontal and k is in, uh, in p is in vertical. Yes, or yes, yes. X horizontal, yes. p in vertical. Yes. Um, so if there is zero nonlinearity, then essentially we have only one variable. Um, so now we introduce some little nonlinearity, and we see that we have well, there would only be quasi periodic trajectories. There should be another two fixed. Point there. Sorry. Okay, this um, Right, so um, the tori, they start to deform. Um, the tori are the surfaces of constant motion in the base case of the original homotopy. So we see a cross section of that. Okay, so um, there is, I think, angle and action. Yes. Yes. Um, and so there are. Electric fixed points in hyperbolic And so K starts to appear, but at this point of value, we're probably not seeing it. Um, okay. So let's go to this. And uh, just one more thing. We'll try a large point of value. So as K sets in, <coughs> um, these tori, the surfaces of Nice points of motion break down. Um, so there is no periodic motion, at all. there's only quasi periodic motion, and they break down um, in order that is to do with the binding number associated with the tori. So the most irrational one breaks down um, last. And that happens at around k equals 1. But although, although it breaks down, nothing special really happens in that. So let's see, let's start off with this initial position. Okay, um, okay so we have a period. Now here is, we start it off and we'll see a chaotic trajectory. Notice that it's not really obvious the way in which it fills the phase space. Um, yeah, and then again, there, are, there is an electric point, and there are uh, chaotic and periodic orbits on all scales. So it's kind of more difficult to analyze. This would be a period two, I think, at this point. Yes, so, um, and that should be chaos here, but it's slow in getting here. So yes, so that's what happens. This is the system we're trying to analyze. So let's see what happens when we start off with a flat initial distribution of the configuration states. And we hold that distribution. What is the mutual information between the past and the future distributions? So what we see is actually something like this. Okay? So unlike in the logistic model, we see here clear resolution dependency. So um, this axis can be thought of as probability resolution. Um, this is PMI. Now, different curves correspond to different nonlinearity values. So, for example, um, let's take I don't know, let's take this curve. So, this is k equals one. We see that as we increase the resolution, so as we, I suppose, 
uh, we get more and more information about the system in the past, we would get more and more information about the state of the system in the future. So the resolution is increasing to the right or to the left? Um, it's increasing to the right. Yeah. Um, but here resolution you mean in the number of pins we consider to measure the mutual information? Or? So actually here what, what I mean is um, it's kind of like log n of the k. So it's the number of nearest neighbors you consider in your estimator um, of your PMI. So the depth of resolution is something you suppose. Um, so PMI grows. It sort of make, makes sense. The more you, the more you know to start off with, the, the more you know in the end. Um, so one thing is is that it tends to grow linearly with resolution. Um, and another thing is that strange occurrence that's happening here. So here um, we find that for the same value of resolution, um, if you Add nonlinearity to the system, you will actually reduce your ability to predict the future. So essentially, nonlinearity looks like it functions in an inverse way, in not an intuitive fashion. Now, of course, this is to do with slow relaxation times and to do with stickiness, all these phenomena that happen when cantoric break down and become cantoric, and strange things happen. Um, but, but when these are more or less out of the way, then with increased nonlinearity, um, you know less and less and less. So here is sort of the intuitive side. So how can we interpret this? We can interpret the resolution dependency of PMI through the information dimensions of the underlying spaces. Okay. So when we write the Shannon entropy through um, the entropy of the discretized system. Um, then we can see that PMI should actually vary as a function of logarithm of probability resolution. Okay, so it should grow with probability resolution. Now, it should grow with this uh, at this rate defined by gamma. We need to turn gamma something so we turn to the information per dimension. It's a sort of relative deficit in the information dimensions of the marginals and the information dimensions of the joint. So it sort of mimics, in some faraway way, um, the definition of mutual information. Okay? So this is what we, uh, how we look at the slopes. Okay? The slopes should be equal to this. Or the linear version. The slopes should be equal to that. Um, so actually, actually, you would have seen this in the logistic map. Because there is a parameter value in the logistic map and PMI does value to vary with resolution, and that is the period of the accumulation point. Okay, so I think there the attracting set is um, a counter set that has a dimension. And we indeed see that PMI grows as with a rate of 1. So there's full causality um, there. That's perhaps mm, not important. Um, yes, yeah, so if you look at the previous graph, the big graph with many lines, and you just measure the slopes of the lines, what will we get? As a function of the color of those graphs, so as a function of nonlinearity, we'll get something like this. Okay? So those anomalous uh, situations there will be translated to peaks in the camera. Okay? These peaks are not expected. Um, so it will, gamma will decay to zero which is nice. Um, a zero limit of gamma means that the information dimension of the joint distribution is just the sum of the information dimension of the dimensions of the marginals. Um, what I've plotted here are two plots. There are many parameters in all the set. The two most important parameters perhaps are the sample size and the time gap. Sample size is intimately related to, oh, perhaps I should call it not sample size, but uh, probability resolution. There is always an interplay between probability resolution, so um, really how well you know the system, and time gap, so how much time you put between past and future, right? That should sort of go towards losing causality. 
that was not nice thing, not nice thing. So it's hard to to bring out interrelations of N and Tau. They are not really they're not really obvious. So the peak will go down in one way depending on N and another way depending on Tau. This is how. So what we do is we look at say, well here what happens when K is equal to zero. A very nice solvable Hamiltonian. So um, just a simple theoretic and quasi periodic map. Um, so this is what we see. This is PMI as a function of resolution for k equals zero. Now, um, so this is resolution on the x, uh, PMI on the ordinate, and what are plotted are different, um, well, it's for different sample sizes. This is for tau equals 50. This is for tau equals 80. So for different kinds of operations. Um, this is perhaps, what we see is that there are two clear gradients of PMI. Mission information grows in two very distinct and nicely logarithmic ways, um, which we can put together. So this is the equivalent of the two plots we just saw. And this is their collapsed version. Um, so this is perhaps the easiest to talk about. For the fully integrable case, <coughs> we see that gamma changes from well from one to a third. There should be an asymptote an asymptote in the third here. Now gamma equals one corresponds to the fully causal load. The information dimension of the joint is the same as the information dimension of any rational. Um, and the third actually corresponds to the joint information dimension of three, which, if you think about it, is exactly the joint information dimension of regular trajectories, right? Because they lie in well defined. Um, Circles or deformed circles, or in this case, could be lines um, in the state space. And how it does it, um, you can bring out, you can clearly bring out the interdependency between resolution and time gap. So, for mixing arguments, it's actually tau cubed that is proportional to, to n, to some size. Okay. Um, this is to do with the wrapping around because you have periodicities in that clause. So, you can play the game for many parameter values. And for a lot of them, there is a nice class. So, the top plots are just normal information for dimensions of the gradient versus a logarithm of time gap. And the bottom plots are the rescale version. So, this was the sort of regular rescaling. And we see that it works fine. Until suddenly, of course, it's not sudden, it's very, very gradual. Um, at about k being to 0.97, so at around the time when the final cam curve breaks down, there is no more clear scaling anymore. Okay. So suddenly there is a mixture, well, a more perceptible mixture of the different trajectory types that you can't bring up clearly in this, uh, in this relation. Um, yes. So then, what happens at larger uh, non-linearity values is again. Um, so we try to collapse the plots, and we succeed. We succeed only partially. So actually, what we see is that there appear to be two. This plot appears to consist in two different. Um, from two different constituents. Um, the lower half, which does collapse, okay? so this corresponds to the regular mixing. And this, which will collapse, it looks regular, this would correspond to really fast chaos mixing. Okay? Um, so this is to do with regular scaling. So this leads us to postulating something. This leads us to say, okay, well, um, there, are, there seem to be two clear regimes, one chaotic and one regular. So what if all that happens in this map is just a mixture of 
what happens to regular trajectories and what happens to chaotic trajectories. Is it just as simple as that? Hmm? So we postulate the nature hypothesis, which essentially says, okay, what if our gamma is just a result of what's well, probably easier to express in the information dimension of the joint? What if our information dimension of the joint distribution is just a sum in proportions of the information dimension of the chaotic components and the regular components? And we test this. Now, the problem here is that for the standard map, how do you find out the proportion of regular, or proportion of regular trajectories, the measure of, say, the regular part? Um, what you can do is you can look at trajectory directions. So you start off with many, many pairs of points, all the cases around this state space of the standard map. And you look at how the distribution of those distances evolves in time. So here you have many, many pairs for, I think you started at 10 to the minus 12, so very, very close together. And then you see clearly that some points, they tend to stick together, well, relatively together. And other points, they tend to diverge quite fast, in fact, at a different rate than regular points. Okay, so we're being very cheeky, we're defining um, chaos through a neighborhood. The Hodgson's standard map doesn't exist to do that because of the um, interdependency of chaos and regular trajectories. If you do, and it seems to it seems to work here, but let's see if it actually works. So then to just to find out how much just to check that if we locate the peak of the very very slow, the left peak, then it evolves in just a normal fashion. This this is around one, it's heavily dependent on how we measure it. Um, whereas the fast peak actually involves as a logarithmic rate. Okay, so um, this is t and this is log t. So indeed, perhaps they do correspond to regular and chaotic trajectories. So then the amount of regular trajectories would just be the, the total sum of all the frequencies. It's a, the measure, the left hand measure. Um, Yes, so what we do is we want to more or less vigorously measure how much of the weight of, say, the regular component in the map. We do it by introducing a cutoff point here and a cutoff time. And we say, okay, at that time, um, how much, how many trajectories, the fraction of the trajectories are to the, located to the left well, distances are located to the left. Okay. So essentially, how many pairs have not um, evolved fast? Okay. Now, in this case, um, when we measured, so Tc is the cutoff time and epsilon is the cutoff fraction. Um, in this case, we see a nice clear plateau. So, what I haven't shown here is that if you look at large enough times, there will be a peak here, there will be nothing in between. And then there will be a lot of, well, there will be a sort of linear piece, this is a logarithmic really scale, um, close to zero. So the two peaks will separate. Okay? The separation corresponds to the plateau um, of this fraction. Now, here we see lines that are not really well put, and that's why they already start to, to cross over the left hand peak. Um, so then we take we take this method and we try to look at the information dimensions of the chaotic component and the regular component. Right. That's yeah. So this is what we get. Um, this is information dimensions. Joint information dimensions. This is time. So the green line corresponds to the regular component. The blue line corresponds to the chaotic component. And the red line is the combination of the two. Combined in a way, well, with the fractions defined. Okay? 
what we see, of course, what we, what we would want to see is that right wing trajectories have, uh, during the information generation three and the other ones have one and four. That's not what we see. The errors are quite small. However, they are quite close to the line, so it's perhaps a bit inconclusive to say that they're not actually equal to three and four. Um, so yes, what do we do? The nice thing that we see here is this sort of key. Exactly the thing that we saw sort of was separating the two regions um, in the information for dimension plot. So we find out that at least some features could be explained using this picture. And so let's try to explain the main uh, the main variable. So here I plotted gamma. This is for again k equals two. Um, gamma went like this, so this is for a particular sample size. Um, gamma is the information for dimension. And blue is the modified gamma. So this is the rate of mutual information increase um, <coughs> that would have been there if there was only if there were only chaotic trajectories, regular trajectories and they were interacting in this obvious way. Okay. Um, this is lower than the rate that we actually measure. So actually, information in this system gets lost faster, um, probably due to interdependencies, than would be suggested just by the existence of two trajectory types. Okay. Um, Yes, so we, we did this for k equals 2. For other nonlinearity parameter values, it's harder. Because there, you don't have bimodal distributions of um, well, trajectory separation. For example, um, this is k equals 0.9. So somewhere from when we saw this now last week. So here we have trajectories, they all start off being separated by some. But then, the chaotic ones are not really clear in exiting the speak. What we see is the sort of seepage of chaotic, well, pairwise points that diverge faster. So there isn't really a typical speed with which, with which points diverge. Um, this is perhaps to do with stickiness. So, when K increases from zero, Tori starts to break down. Okay? So some chaotic trajectories appear, um, but they somehow get stuck if they're close to the remains of these Tori. Um, then more and more and more Tori break down. So it's as if there is this accumulation of stickiness that reaches its apogee somewhere before the final time Tori break down. For example. Okay. And perhaps this is what we saw in the peak we now see in this trajectory separation framework. Um, but perhaps it is, we, dis we sort of just proved the metric hypothesis for k equals 2, and it's harder to even try to work with it for the k values. Um, another way of dealing with this is to look at the um, multi fractal spectrum of the um, joint distribution. And to ask um, if there the information dimensions is composed of, of two different contributions. And then on the Q tower picture, it will, it will have different asymptotes. So, partially, that's what we're doing now, but it's, I'm not showing that. Um, yes, so this is um, more towards current research. So, we have this information that could dimension measure cross I've shown earlier. The ones that start at 1 and decrease. Um, to, well, k equals to pi, they decrease to zero, perhaps they decrease to some asymptotic value. It's really hard to find that there's asymptotic values. Um, because for a lot of parameter values, specifically in those regimes on cam I break down, PMI isn't actually, um, well, it's not actually living, it's not actually not 
So those straight lines, so in the first part, um, this posture that PMI varies with all the resolution is not really applicable there. It's either concave or convex, and it changes. Um, it basically changes. <laughs> mention it. This is a construction of joint entropy from the trajectory separation distribution that we saw. Um, but, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, it's not convoluted. So, let's summarize. Um, so this is the summary of the PMI part. So, in simple dissipative systems, we saw that this measure could sort of tell you how much choice there is, or to be more exact, um, in this case it was periodicity. Okay? So, you uh, might be the log period. This is in simple systems. Um, now, in systems where support spaces, well, I see fact of support spaces, In systems where dimensions of marginals is clearly related to the dimension of the joint, um, then PMI grows its resolution, and you can try to quantify how fast it does so, um, and you can see what the straight does in the standard map. Okay? Um, it, un it unveils some features of the standard map. Um, I think it's possible to use more as options than the map to explain things seen here. Um, yes, so 
this measure of PMI picks up this slowness that happens when the can toric break down, okay? um, which means things are slightly more perhaps predictable there. Um, yes, and it's it's metric dependent. And we saw that there is more things going on in the standard map that perhaps we knew that than just a plain old mixture of chaotic orbits and regular orbits. Yes, so, <laughs> so that is the PMI. Um, I just want to, I don't know how much time I have, I have two slides left. Okay, I just want to briefly um, <coughs> put forward the idea of the metric that Robert and I have So, um, basically, PMI, so mutual information, I think the reason is it's actually the pullback by the divergence. It's not a metric, it's a divergence between um, the joint and the product of the margins. So it quantifies this, uh, this dependency. Okay? Um, what is arbitrary in this our definition of strong emergence is the initial distribution. Who says it should be flat? Who says it should be over the attractor? If it's not over the attractor, then um, in, the stand, in the logistic map we'll see things that will be confusing. Okay. Um, so, Robert and Kai, for example, says, okay, what if we this time try first of all a proper distance, and second, there will be a distance between just the district of, let's say, station distribution over, over um, the integration state and the distribution that is the product of the uh, marginals of the subcomponents. So, for example, in the easy model, it would be um, where each site is independent. Why do you have distribution over that? Um, so, that's a slightly different notion. Um, what <laughs> What goes partially hand in hand with this notion is this metric. Now, it's metric, it's the Gaussian metric, but I think it's actually the spirit of the Gaussian, in the sense that it doesn't appear in the Gaussian's works. Um, it's a metric on space of probability distributions. Now, it's quite, it varies nicely with parameters, but it's quite convoluted, as you see, it's hard to even write down. Um, and it involves the, it involves introducing a space of all modular constant functions in the integration space and taking two suprema, so one within the other. And it's so one suprema over the space of functions and one suprema over the space of configurations, which is uh, here. And it makes it really difficult to uh, confuse. So, Yes. Um, I've tried to compute this for the easing model. So, for example, the easiest thing, the easing ring. Um, it is only beginning to be tractable. It might actually be resolved, but I haven't checked that. Um, if you map the easing ring to the space of um, bonds, then, again, you can check this, but what we would see is that the distance would vary as punch, so as the correlation. You know, to, to Two point correlation coefficient, which would make absolute sense for this kind of measure between zero and one and really nice. Um, but but for a 2D model, if anyone can do it, that would be great. Um, it was sort of done, well, not it. The first usage of the metric was uh, done using. Um, two different probability distributions on a system that is uh, a cellular automaton um, developed by one of the people that developed it was Andre Tune and he, he proved some results um, the existence for example of um, two different uh, uh, final probability distributions and you can actually compute the distance between, um, say, an all distribution centered on everything being, say, white, 
um, and a distribution that gives the correct expected probability of each side being red. Right? So I'm two bound. This this is two bound. Um, and you can you can see that they are indeed quite close together. So C C will be quite small relative to the total um, size of the state space, which means relative to the total distance it could be, which is two in this case. Um, yes. So the metric is out there. If anyone wants to try, it's profitable. Um, that's it. So um, some extensions. This is what I'm currently trying to do. So trying to make more sense of what we find with the PMI. Um, there are of course different systems you can look at, such as different groups of chaos or continuous um, time systems, like that engine, which would be quite nice. Um, state which is contained in the in, in Hades some kind of values. Um, you can look at the multi-factor spectrum, then you can develop a whole theory of, of applying PMI to spatially extended systems. There are many ways you can do it. Um, yes. And of course, for the computation of the diffusion metric. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. Are there questions or comments? Victor? How far is this from uh, gradient causality? Because like, they are very similar, right? You take the past, you try to predict the future, but you compare now one point with another point, right, in, in a steady system, for example. Mm -hmm. But the idea is, is more or less the same, you know, this is why it's very different, but the ideas are not that far from, from this, right? Or, um, I remember looking at this. I am more familiar in how to relate to, say, exocentrically and those computational mechanics measures, then... Yeah, but the idea, I mean, my, I mean, my, my point was more about when you have a, a complex system or when you have uh, couplings between different positions, mm -hmm. I and mean, you can compare to which extent I can predict with my past or with the past from somebody else, right? And from there is where it comes. So you can basically use my time series in order to predict his next value. And this is one of the approaches is, is running the causality. So here you could use the same setting, BMI, mm -hmm. but just setting this thing. So I was thinking that uh, you heard something about that. Um, not currently, no. Okay. I think I'm a little bit confused on the, on the details, the difference between the standard map and the logistic map. The logistic map is um, the system of all information really uh, count, um, counts the number of contractors. So if you have two, two different trajectories, then it's local to the... Uh, so, yeah. It counts the number of states, but then uh, it becomes a uh, resolution dependent. Is this what you, say, you mentioned that the difference is this happens when you have a fractal uh, support or something like this, but I've, I've missed what is the when we when do you expect to have a, a system mutual information that is not um, that is diverging with, uh, with the resolution when you have an infinity of attractors or when the attractors are fractal or when I, what well, is the rule? So, for example, when when the system mutual information is I think it's to do with how you uh, how you resolve and how you resolve, how what you resolve compares to what you know of the attractors. So, for example, in the logistic map, we can resolve all the attractors, mm -hmm. okay. um, except for the theory of the accumulation. And when and in the standard map, what, why you cannot resolve that? Because there are infinite of them, or because there is each of them has a strange structure. Um, so there, um, you see something different from one because you have this deficit in information dimension. So the support spaces of the, the marginals and the joints are not related in, in a sort of obvious way. So how you how you resolve one affects how you resolve 
the other. Um, but also, we don't see all the, I mean, constant attractor and standard map is confusing, yes, so it's not that you see everything, right? You group things together. I have a question that goes in the same direction and because I mean, can you make any any comment on the relation of what you are doing with other measures of causality laws? Um, I can make comments of I can make relations of what I'm doing to again computational planet measures. Um, Causality is more a word that we use to signify the loss of, well, loss of causality as time gap increases. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. I don't know mm -hmm. how this relates to actual causality measures or measures of the loss of causality. Great. No questions? Thank you, Marina.